In this video, I'll be describing and demonstrating the steps involved in replacing the timing and balance shaft belts on a later model Porsche 944 with the spring tensioner using the Arnworks tool to set the tension on the belts. This content was covered in my head gasket repair tutorial, but it's been consolidated here given the regularity of the belt service interval on these cars. In addition to the recommended belt maintenance, the drive belts also need to be removed for the following service items front oil seal replacement, whether that be crankshaft or balance shaft, oil pump drive gear replacement, water pump replacement, camshaft housing seal replacement, head gasket replacement, or any work performed on the cylinder head. There are varying opinions with these cars regarding the optimal belt replacement interval. For example, the warranty and maintenance manual states that the condition and tension should be inspected every 30,000 miles, and new belts uh, should be checked between 500 and 2,000 miles and then every 15,000 miles thereafter, but no real mention of replacement. This information basically matches that on Clark's Garage, but the latter also indicates the belt should be changed at 45,000 miles and goes on to say that if the car hasn't been driven to the 15,000 mile inspection point within two years to inspect the belt for wear each year after that. As far as the rollers go, if you spin them and they're noisy, they should be replaced, and all other rollers are typically replaced at every other belt change. That said, the general consensus of the community to include forum posts and conversations with enthusiasts is that a two-year, 30,000-mile interval uh, is appropriate for replacement. Certainly timing belts have lasted longer than 30,000 miles. Um, there are also examples of people saying that their belt failed just after 30,000 miles, so pick what's best for you. Um, the belts aren't terribly expensive, so it's pretty cheap insurance just to replace them. As far as costs go, depending on the manufacturer, the timing belts will run $15 to $25, and the balance shaft belts $30 to $60. And there are kits that include both belts with the rollers and tensioners that run between $200 and $300. So in most situations, if there's an unknown service history or age to the belts, probably best just to go ahead and replace them and if you have the right tools and take your time that's really not too bad. For those who may be uninitiated in the timing belt job on the Porsche 944 it's natural for there to be a little bit of trepidation around the job. You know it's an interference engine what if I make a mistake I don't want to ruin the car uh, but really the Porsche engineers have done most of the work for us uh, with the processes that are in place and all the timing marks and the ability to double check everything and, and kind of take your time and with all the resources that are available provided that you do have the tools uh, and you can follow a series of steps in chronological order um, it's something that can be done so let's go ahead and take a look at everything that needs to be done to access the belts in addition to basic metric tools sockets ratchets some hex heads we will need a torque wrench for reassembly and some form of timing belt tensioning tool this is the maxi kit from Arnworks, which includes the flywheel lock, the pin wrench, and the spanner wrench. Something to lift the car, jack stands or ramps. Uh, we will be underneath to remove the starter and some of the lower accessory belts, but the rest of it will be performed from above the car. In order to access the timing and balance shaft belts, you'll first need to raise and support the car. Remove the air filter housing and airflow meter. Disconnect and remove the cooling fan assembly. Disconnect the spark plug cables and remove the distributor cap and rotor. Remove the power steering pump belt and AC and alternator belt as applicable. Remove the upper and lower belt front covers. And remove the cam gear front cover. I'm gonna start by removing the air filter housing and airflow meter. There are three 10 millimeter nuts in the front and two bolts in the back. A variety of hoses, disconnect the J-boot. And you may have a clamp on the radiator hose up front. And then go ahead and remove the cooling fan assembly. There are three screws along the top and three along the bottom. And that'll clear up some space to access the belts.
Once the spark plug cables are disconnected from the rotor, you can go ahead and pull the rotor off. The ignition rotor is secured by two hook screws, one at the top and one at the bottom. And they're spring loaded if you push them in as far as you can with a screwdriver and turn it about 90 degrees clockwise, it will disengage from hooks inside the cam gear cover and it'll just pop right off. And the rotor is secured with a hex head set screw. Below the car you'll find the V-belt for the power steering pump and the ribbed belt for the AC compressor and alternator. There are two tensioning rods that need to be released. The power steering pump has two 13 millimeter and the AC compressor has two 17 millimeter. You'll need to release the pivot bolts on the mounts, one in the front, one in the rear. These are 13 millimeter. And then on the AC compressor, there is a 17 millimeter up front and a 13 millimeter in the rear. Release those first and then detension the adjustment arms and the belts can come off. With the accessory belts off, the upper and lower front covers for the timing and balance shaft belts can be removed. There are 11 10 millimeter bolts that work around and then three bolts for the cam gear cover. With these items out of the way, the engine can now be set at the top dead center position. I'm going to start by disconnecting the positive terminal on the battery. There are some electrical leads here that go directly to the starter and we don't want to ground out any tools when we go to remove the starter. The starter is secured to the lower clutch housing by two 19 millimeter bolts, one on either side. The two electrical leads should first be disconnected using a 13 millimeter and an 8 millimeter wrench. Once the leads are moved aside, the starter can be unbolted and removed. Later, the flywheel lock will be installed at this location. I'm now going to set the engine to top dead center and install the flywheel lock so that the balance shaft and camshaft belts can be removed. Top dead center is when the piston in cylinder number one is at the highest point of its compression stroke. It's used to align all the components needed for proper ignition timing. Really, this process can be completed at any point after removing the starter, but for demonstration purposes, it's nice to see how everything moves together. Setting top dead center involves rotating the crankshaft in a clockwise direction while observing certain alignment marks. The transmission will need to be in neutral and the engine will rotate more easily with the spark plugs removed or loosened. We'll use a 24 millimeter deep socket or extension and a long ratchet to rotate the engine from the front using the crankshaft bolt inside the power steering pump drive pulley. There are a few different ways to determine top dead center. The first is using an alignment notch at the bottom center of the bell housing. The second is through a square opening in the top of the bell housing above the speed and reference sensors. It's important to note that the crankshaft rotates twice for every single rotation of the camshaft. So if we simply set the crankshaft to top dead center without looking at the position of the camshaft, we may actually be at top dead center for the exhaust stroke for cylinder number one. We'll use the camshaft gear as a guide and as the alignment marks get closer, we're looking for the letters OT to appear on the flywheel through the window opening on the bell housing. Stopping when the alignment marks on the flywheel match the alignment tab. At that point, all marks can be double checked and the flywheel lock installed in the location of the starter mount. When installing the flywheel lock, it's easier to loosely secure one side first, then pivot the teeth into the ring gear, and finally thread and tighten the second bolt. 
With the flywheel lock installed, work can now be performed on the car while maintaining engine position to properly set ignition timing. Now that the belts are exposed and the engine is set at top dead center, we can begin the removal process. Located in front of the timing belt is the balance shaft belt. There are two twin balance shafts, one upper and one lower. They rotate in opposite directions at twice the speed of the crankshaft. And their purpose is to offset some of the forces created by the pistons, which move at a 45 degree angle in this engine. And while the engine can technically run without the balance shaft belt installed, it does work to reduce vibrations on the engine. Here's a closer look at the lower balance shaft. This system features a tensioning roller and an idler roller, both of which have a 24 millimeter tensioning nut and a 17 millimeter lock nut. So this has to be held in place while loosening the lock nut and upon doing so, this can be rotated counterclockwise to relieve tension. The rollers and the gears can remain in place unless we are removing the water pump. Uh, in this case, we'll leave those on and simply pull the belt off and make note of the direction of rotation if you're gonna be reusing the belt. With the balance shaft belt out of the way, we can now remove the timing belt. The earlier cars featured a tensioning roller similar to what we saw on the balance shaft system. However, in 1987, Porsche switched to a spring tensioning unit that has a 13 millimeter lock nut and a 13 millimeter bolt that will be loosened. Then insert the pin wrench into the faceplate, tilt it this direction to relieve tension and then while holding it, we'll lock those connections back down so that it stays loose. Remove the 17 millimeter bolt on the roller. The tension will be measured on this upper span when we reinstall and it helps to have a little bit of space there. And then two 10 millimeter nuts on the guide plate. And finally, the spring tensioner will be removed for clearance. It's secured by three 13 millimeter nuts, one on the top right, one on the lower right, and one on the left, just underneath the swing arm. I will say that while it is a whole heck of a lot easier to remove the timing belt with these pulleys and the crankshaft sprocket out of the way, in my opinion, it's more work to get those removed than just to tilt the belt sideways and work it out the bottom, which is what we'll do. And again, if you're reusing your belt, just make note of the rotational direction so that you can reinstall it the same way that it came off. With the timing and balance shaft belts removed, you can perform other work on the car or begin the belt replacement process. To install the timing belt, we'll first confirm that the flywheel mark is properly set to top dead center and that the timing marks on the cam gear are aligned as well. We'll start rounding the belt down below around the crankshaft sprocket in between this rear belt cover, tilting the belt slightly and gently working it in. Try not to excessively twist or crimp the belt as that could damage it. As the belt is being routed, we will install the spring tensioner. The connections on the spring tensioner, as well as the guide plate, are tightened to 15 foot-pounds. The tension will be pulled up along the upper span. Remember that the crankshaft is going to spin in a clockwise direction, so as soon as this starts to move, we want this to move with it for proper timing. If there's any slack in there, we'll be, there'll be some movement on the crankshaft taking up the slack before the cam gear starts to spin. Route it down over the water pump pulley and in front of the tensioning gear. We'll then release the tension on the spring tensioner and 
measure the belt tension using the tensioning tool. The engine will be rotated a few cycles to confirm that ignition timing is correct and the belt will be checked again to make sure that the tension on the belt is correct. And finally the idler roller can be installed right above the belt and that is torqued to a value of 33 foot-pounds. The timing belt is now properly routed with an initial tensioning set using the spring tensioner by releasing the two connections and then locking them back down, testing the tension on the upper span with a 90 degree twist. If you happen to have an earlier car with the eccentric roller, uh, you can just turn it counterclockwise and then lock down the 17 millimeter nut once this uh, twists to about a 90 degree interval. And so what we'll do now is remove the flywheel lock and rotate the crankshaft two times or the camshaft one time around and then we will reverse the direction counterclockwise one and a half teeth going this way to relieve tension on the upper span and then we'll take a measurement using the tensioning tool. There are a few different tools out there that you can use. Uh, the cheapest one of course is the 90 degree twist method. That does introduce a human component However, and moderate finger and thumb pressure to one person may differ from another. There are also some low-cost alternatives, the Cricut or the Gates belt tensioning tool, and the general consensus on those is kind of work for serpentine belts, but um, not as consistent for timing belts. I've never personally used it. And then on the high end of things, of course, is the Porsche P9201 tensioning tool, which runs about $1,000. So the Arnworks tool is probably the best quality aftermarket option and uh, it has been providing some consistent results for me. These spring tensioners are sometimes referred to as auto tensioners and they're not really an auto tensioner in a sense that they apply the correct tensioning to the belt. Uh, in fact this one I've found frequently applies too much tension after taking a measurement on the tool and I have to kind of back it off a little bit. Um, so while they could get you by for a short span if you needed to, it is best to um, be a little bit scientific about it and take a measurement using some kind of tool to make sure that it's accurate. For the longevity of the engine, it's important that the belt tension is set correctly. If it's set too loose, the belt could potentially start skipping teeth and then the timing is off and the engine 
would not run properly, and if you skip too many teeth, then you're going to damage your valve train by pushing it down into the pistons. If it's too tight, we put unnecessary stress on things like the water pump pulley, and there's a bearing in here that goes connected to the shaft on the impeller, and that could prematurely wear out, starts making an awful noise, and it could also put some unnecessary stress on your camshaft and things. So um, if you're going to do the 90 degree twist method and kind of roll with it, it's best to be a little bit too loose than a little bit too tight. Um, so if you if you twist it and you can't quite get it vertical, then it's probably too tight. Uh, if it goes far beyond vertical, then it's too loose. Uh, but essentially, just trying to get it right in that middle point there. Um, but we'll use the tool in this case and we'll make sure that everything is to specification. So we'll apply the tool here on the span, take some measurements, and I personally like to check it twice, so I'll rotate it around a second time and check the tensioning one final time and make sure the timing is correctly aligned before moving on to the balance shaft belt. With the flywheel lock removed, we can now rotate the crankshaft two rotations using the 24 millimeter deep socket, which will be one rotation on the camshaft. We'll look for the OT mark on the flywheel and then confirm that the cam gear is correctly timed as well. And if everything is in alignment, we'll go ahead and back it up 10 degrees, which is about one and a half teeth on the cam gear to relieve pressure on the upper span, and then we'll take our measurement. To properly position the Ironworks tensioning tool, there is a recess in the lower bracket of the tool that will rest upon the upper nut of the guide plate. Make sure that the two aluminum sleds go on the top of the bell and the pin goes underneath the bell in between some of the nubs. Then the locking connections can be released on the spring tensioner and the tensioner can be moved forward or back to increase or decrease pressure. Check the dial on the gauge and ensure that it is within specification. Then pop the gauge by pulling the connection at the top a couple times, let it settle in, and then you can adjust forward and back as needed to make sure that it is properly tensioned. Bruce will sometimes make modifications to his tools and update the associated instructions as well, so just make sure you're following the instructions for your tool. This is the 920X version 6.1, so the values that I'll be looking for on this used belt that has 2,000 miles on it are .x01 to .x05, 05 being looser than 01. If it were a new belt, I'd be in the .x90 to .x97 range. He uses an X here on this tool. Um, it's the tense position, which is red on the smaller dial. If the tool is calibrated, you really don't need to look at that too much. It'll sweep around and fall within the indicated ranges. Um, if you have the newer tool, the, the 6.2 includes some different values um, as well as that tense position. So just make sure you're looking at the right information. And once you have the tensioning value dialed in, you can remove the tool and set the engine back to top dead center so that we can begin to install the balance shaft belt. I've got the engine set back to top dead center and the flywheel lock reinstalled for the balance shaft belt. And last thing we'll do is put in a little idler roller. This bolt is tensioned again to 33 foot-pounds. And I like to put a little bit of blue Loctite on these because when I first got the car, this bolt actually backed out and made contact with the belt and got launched up here and wedged in between the belt covers. So I uh, got lucky that it didn't tear anything up, but I like to make sure these are nice and secure because of that. To install the balance shaft belt, it will first be routed below the crankshaft sprocket, up around the upper shaft, over the idler and the tensioning roller, and then back underneath in between the upper section of the lower shaft and this idler, and then back down underneath the crankshaft. Once it's in position, I like to temporarily wedge a shop towel in here so that there's pressure applying the belt into the teeth of this gear. And then we can pull the slack up and around and back down so that the alignment marks don't move as you're tensioning the roller. And that way you don't have to worry about 
moving it forward or back, um, everything's tight. And then once we get the correct tensioning value, you can just pull that rag out and lock everything down. We'll be using the spanner wrench to hold the position of the rollers and a 17 millimeter socket to lock them down. The tensioning tool to evaluate the tension setting on the belt, a dot five millimeter feeler gauge that goes in between the roller and the lower shaft sprocket. Some of the sources will tell you that there is a one millimeter clearance on the upper span over the roller. The factory workshop manual though has that written as a deflection uh, between zero and one millimeter so it just apply a little bit of upward movement on the belt to prevent slap going on and so that's how we'll set it. As the balance shaft belt is being routed, you want to make sure that the two alignment marks are in correct timing. So they're located on the back plate of each of the shaft sprockets. And on the upper balance shaft, that aligns with a notch in the top of the belt cover. And on the lower balance shaft, it aligns with a tab protruding from the lower section of that belt cover. The routing is simplified by having the idler roller positioned off and to the right and you can kind of lock it down so it's out of the way while you route the belt and as you move the belt over the tensioning roller you can just turn that to the loosest setting to get some more wiggle room there and work the belt on. And because I've removed all the slack from the belt sections right before contacting the upper and lower shafts in between the crankshaft sprocket there's essentially no movement in the shafts away from their alignment marks as we turn the tensioning roller because it's just removing slack from that upper span. And so an initial tension is set on the roller, testing a 90 degree twist on the belt, and you can remove the towel. And now the belt is properly routed and ready to take a reading on the tensioning tool. Before we apply the tensioning tool, we just want to make sure that the slack is on this upper span by giving it a couple pulls. And when we apply the tool, the aluminum sleds will go on top of the balance shaft belt and the shaft pin will go underneath in between two of the nubs. And once it's in position, you can pop the gauge and take a reading. With the belt tension measurement tool in place, we can go ahead and release the lock nut on the tensioning roller. You can turn the roller clockwise to tighten or counterclockwise to loosen and just watch the gauge as you turn it back and forth. And once it's in alignment with the correct value, you can go ahead and tighten down the lock nut on the roller and remove the gauge. The deflection values that we're looking for on this particular tool, whether it's a new or used belt, are going to be .x06 to .x14. Next we'll install the half millimeter feeler gauge in between the idler roller and the lower shaft sprocket. You can turn the idler adjustment up just a little bit so that we have a zero to one millimeter deflection on the upper span of the belt. So the belt's just resting on the roller. And then while you're holding that adjustment nut in place, you can lock it down with the 17 millimeter. Now that everything is tensioned correctly, we can go ahead and set the nuts to the 33 foot-pound specification, tighten everything down, or remove the flywheel lock, and rotate the crankshaft twice around. 
and confirm that all the timing marks are in alignment. It's not uncommon for the timing marks on the balance shaft sprockets to be off by about a half a tooth and still be accurate. Uh, you can see I can even wiggle this belt cover back and forth, which kind of changes the alignment. But if they're off by a full tooth or more, that would be something that you'd want to check and make sure that it's properly aligned. A properly tensioned balance shaft belt is going to seem quite loose in most cases, uh, significantly looser than the timing belt and even the accessory belts. And if you're going to do a 90 degree twist on it, you're more than likely going to be able to easily twist it just past 90 degrees, and that's okay. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of force to spin the weighted shafts on here, so it's a pretty loose running belt. With the timing and balance shaft belts correctly installed and tensioned, we can now reinstall the front cam gear cover, front belt covers, and move on to the accessory belts. With the front covers in place, we can now install the lower accessory belts. The accessory belts are routed over these pulleys uh, below the car, and the ribbed belt is for the alternator, AC compressor, and this larger pulley. And the V-belt is for the power steering pump and the V-belt pulley. Once those are appropriately positioned, we'll go ahead and apply tension by twisting the turnbuckles. And these turnbuckles have a locking nut on each side. It's two 17 millimeter connections on the AC compressor and two 13 millimeter connections for the power steering pump. We'll then test the tension by applying an upward thumb pressure. The V-belt gets a deflection of just five millimeters and the AC compressor is a little bit tighter at just two millimeters of upwards deflection. Once it's appropriately adjusted, we can go ahead and lock down the pivot bolt connections on top of the power steering pump, which are 13 millimeter, and as well on the AC compressor, there's a 17 millimeter in front and a 13 millimeter in back. And then I'll reinstall the cooling fan assembly, which is best fed up from below the car. Bolt it down with the three screws along the top and three along the bottom and reconnect the power connectors. Now that the accessory belts and cooling fan assembly are in place, we can begin working on the ignition components. Next up is the ignition rotor. I'll be replacing this rotor because some of the plastic material chipped off during operation. And that just goes on mounted with the set screw. Followed by the distributor cap, we can see that the cap has the spring-loaded hooks to mount to the front of the cam gear cover. And if we position these hooks with the top one pointing to the left and the lower one pointing to the right, you can essentially just do a 90 degree turn counterclockwise to catch the adjoining hooks inside the cam gear cover. And if the hooks aren't catching initially, it's probably because they're not pushed in far enough. Uh, they need to be almost completely bottomed out in the housing to appropriately connect with the other hooks inside. With the distributor cap in place, you can go ahead and reconnect the spark plug cables and the ignition coil cable. Make sure that the routing order matches the number of cylinders, numbered from one to four from front to back, and that it is aligned with the ignition sequence, one, three, four, two, which translates as one, three, four, and two on the distributor cap. Once all the ignition components are in place, it's time to reinstall the airflow meter and air filter housing, reconnect the airflow meter, install the starter, reconnect the cables to the battery, and test engine operation.